We Will Rock You was written by Queen's guitarist Brian May and recorded by the band in 1977 for their album News of the World. It has become one of the most iconic and recognisable pieces of modern music and is arguably the greatest rock anthem to have ever been written. But what else can we learn from this song? What are the secrets are buried within its seemingly simple structure? Well, in this video, I'm going to share with you seven songwriting secrets that I learned from analysing this song and talk you through some techniques and methods that you can immediately apply to your songwriting craft no matter what style or genre you're writing in. Secret number one, the power of simplicity. This song starts with the most basic of drum grooves. We've got kick and snare played in a fairly classic rock groove, except the snare is really being emphasized by hand claps and the kick is being emphasized by foot stomps. And the simplicity of this drum groove is a very powerful thing because the reality is simple is hard to do. As Chopin said so eloquently, simplicity is the final achievement. And in the case of We Will Rock You, simplicity equals powerful. This groove that is created feels tribal, it feels primal. It's uncluttered and simple and drives the song forward from that very first beat. And because the arrangement is so sparse, when Freddie Mercury's voice finally comes in, we're hyper-focused on his delivery. We're paying really close attention to the very few elements that are in the mix. And this is what simplicity allows for. It allows us to draw the listener's attention to a few specific elements and really make those elements land emotionally with the listener. And whilst the groove is very simple, the power of it really comes from the layers. Now we can layer up the stomps, do the same with the claps. And this is of course what you can do by yourself if you have other people around, getting them to do it with you at the same time creates that lovely natural variation. But this is the way you would do it by yourself in the studio. And now we add the drum textures to fill out the sound. Secret number two, using the voice as a percussive instrument. Like all great anthems, this song is really about the refrain line, the we will rock you line. And so the verses are there to take us on the journey, give us the narrative, build up the tension so that tension can then be released when the refrain line lands. But the unusual thing about the lyrical phrasing in the verses of this song is that there's very little emphasis on pitch movement and a lot of emphasis on rhythmic movement. And the verse melody is really centered around this one repeated note that Freddie Mercury hits in a very short staccato rhythmic way before then descending at the end of the phrase down the pentatonic scale. <laughs> take out the lyrics and simply play the notes, you can still feel all the bounce and all the rhythm and all the drive of this phrasing. Secret number three, moving the story through a timeline. It's often hard to know how to structure our verses and sometimes we're simply describing a moment in time. But in this case, we hear Buddy going through different phases of his life. So we see here, Buddy, you're a boy, make a big noise in the first line. As we jump down to the second verse, Buddy is now a young man, a hard man. And finally, in the third verse, we get Buddy, you're an old man, a poor man. And the effect of this is really one of nostalgia or reflection because we're, we're looking back on this guy's life. We're thinking about the phases that we all go through with our own lives. And so it's a clever device to really structure your songs this way, assigning each verse to a different era and telling really the life of a person rather than just the day or the moment in the life of a person. We also get this sense that nothing's really changed for him. He's gotten older, but it always ends the same way. Mud on your face, big disgrace. And so there really doesn't feel like there's any transformation for this character. It feels like life was always hard and it remained hard at the end. And this at first might seem a little contradictory with the main theme of the song, We Will Rock You, which feels like a confident affirmation, a powerful statement. But when you break it down, maybe that's what the intent was all along. To have a character who's always up against it, who's always struggling, who's always being told they're not good enough, and yet choosing to continue in their struggle, continue in their fight. And of course, Lyrics are always open to interpretation and that's one of the most beautiful and fascinating things about them. And so please let me know in the comments what you interpret this song to be all about and how it resonates with you. Secret number four, turning the chorus into an anthem. 
We've talked about this idea that Freddie Mercury was using his voice as essentially a percussion instrument in the verse, and we hear the busyness of the phrasing at the beginning of the verse get a little less busy as we head towards the refrain line. And this is an interesting phenomena called phrasal deceleration. Essentially, if we go from having a lot of notes within the bar to less notes within the bar, the feeling is one of deceleration even though the tempo is the same. And this song is a masterclass in phrasal deceleration because we hear Freddie Mercury with some very busy phrasing at the beginning, and he slowly decelerates down towards the refrain line. And when the refrain line finally lands, we hear it landing on downbeats only. We will, we will rock you. We know that things placed on the downbeat are solid, they're stable, they reinforce the central message, and this is exactly what you want from a chorus line or a refrain line, and it's certainly what you want from an anthem. So one of the ways you can take any kind of statement or refrain line and really turn it into an anthem is to deliberately place it on these very solid downbeats and make it feel almost like a chant. And this is exactly what happens when the song is played at stadiums or at sporting events. It invites everybody in the stadium to join in. And in this way, Queen really wrote the perfect anthem. It is big, bold, and irresistible to sing along to. Which makes sense when you really consider how the song came about. As the story goes, Queen had played a show at Bingley Hall in Stafford, May 29, 1977. And at the end of that show, the crowd began to sing what is known as a classic football anthem, You'll Never Walk Alone. And Brian May in particular was really moved by this experience. In an interview with Radio 1, he said, We were just completely knocked out and taken aback. It was quite an emotional experience, really. And following that experience, the band wanted to come up with their own anthem that the crowd could engage with, sing along to, clap along to, even stomp along to. Which brings us to the fifth secret, listening to your audience. Brian May in particular seemed very moved by that Bingley Hall experience. But what happened next is the important part. He could have easily dismissed it as just a rowdy, excitable crowd, but instead he took that experience and used it to create a song that he could give back to the people a song that they could perform along with the band. He actively sought to include the audience and seek more engagement with them to make them feel like they were part of the show. And this is one of the reasons that Queen became one of the most famous and successful live bands of all time. As songwriters and musicians, we're often focused on making music for our own creative pleasure. We're focused on the details, we're buried in the work, and that is an important part of the process, a crucial part of the process. But what's fascinating and rather obvious in hindsight is this idea that Perhaps the greatest rock anthem of all time was born out of this very simple idea of giving everyone in the crowd a song that they could perform, not just the band. And by making it all about the beat and the chanting, everybody in the crowd was able to feel part of the song and weren't limited by not being able to play an instrument. Instead, they got to use their feet, their hands, their voices. And for a very brief moment, they got to feel like they belonged in a rock band. Secret number six. It's short. The original recorded version of this song is two minutes and two seconds. It's straight to the point. It's no fluff. There's no filler. But one question that always comes up for a songwriters is, how long should the song be? And the answer is often one of those frustratingly philosophical ones, which is as long as it needs to be. And so how do we decide how long a song needs to be? How do we decide what the song's purpose is, what the function is, why this song was created in the first place? In this case, Queen created an anthem that was designed to encourage people to sing along, to clap along. And so we have three refrains, three opportunities for the crowd to join in. But once that's done, the song really has served its purpose. And had it have been even 30 or 40 seconds longer, we may not think of this song so affectionately. Perhaps part of the charm is that it's so short and so sweet and so to the point. An extra 30 or 40 seconds we may have felt the song was just dragging, starting to erode some of that impact and that punch of the refrain lines. Now, there is no songwriting formula. There is no set amount of time a song should be. Some songs need six and a half minutes to really tell us the story from beginning to end, to give us the details, to take us on that journey. And in the case of We Will Rock You, Queen felt that it needed to be short, it needed to be sharp, three verses, three refrains, in and out, but not before we hear Brian May's soaring electric guitar enter at a fairly unexpected moment and bring the song home. Which brings us to secret number seven, using an unconventional song form. 
This song is not following your typical verse chorus verse chorus structure, nor is it following one of the other very popular forms AABA. Essentially, we hear three refrain lines and three verses back to back. And we hear this in other song forms as well, but what makes this really unusual is the fact that it's essentially a cappella and drums all the way through these sections. And whilst there are lots of variations of song forms, there's something delightfully surprising and charming about this one, having it essentially stripped back to just vocals and drums for most of the song, and then finishing with this really heavy electric rock guitar sound at the end. And there's some great single note playing in that last section. Brian May truly is one of the great guitar players of all time. But what's really beautiful about it for me is the final rhythmic riff that he settles into. And the song up until this point has all been around the E minor chord. When we finally get the guitar part from Brian May, it's really focusing on the A major chord. And it's essentially a country lick that he's playing on his electric guitar up on the 14th fret, lots of distortion. But if we take that lick and put it down on the second fret, play it on acoustic, it sounds like this. And this is such a great thing to remember that there's so much crossover between blues and country and folk and rock and R&B and soul. We can often find so much inspiration from these other forms of music that whilst we don't necessarily play them, these concepts transfer beautifully over to the style that we're making music in. Mm -hmm. 